I don't know how many of you met um, Lord Desai before, but he is a very, very well-known figure in the world of economic study and speaking. He's a distinguished uh, former professor uh, at the London School of Economics and extremely well known for his comments and for uh, his speeches over time. He has a point of view and he will express that point of view occasionally, I'm sure, quite strongly. Uh, a month ago, he was in Goa, where he delivered the keynote lecture on good governance, a key to economic success. He said, you cannot have a permanently growing economy if the system is corrupt and not credible. India needs a regular economic system which can encourage people to start businesses, take risk and expect un hindered returns. And at the same occasion he said, I'm tired of waiting, I've come to talk, not to have tea. Punctuality is an important part of governance. I think you'll get the measure of the man from that. But briefly, if it is possible to do so in such a distinguished um, background, Meghnad Desai, Baron Desai, uh, is an Indian-born British economist and was a Labour politician. He unsuccessfully stood for the Speaker in the British House of Lords in 2011 the first ever non-UK born candidate to do so. And he's been awarded the Padma Bhushan, the third highest civilian award in the Republic of India. He was born in Vadodara in Gujarat in India and grew up with two brothers and a sister. He is said to have gone to secondary school at the age of seven and matriculated at 14. His master's degree was from the University of Mumbai after which he won a scholarship to the University of Pennsylvania and then completed his PhD at Pennsylvania in 1963. He has a very distinguished academic career. He worked as associate specialist in the Department of Agricultural Economics in Berkeley. He then became a lecturer at the LSE in 1965, and at the LSE he taught econometrics, macroeconomics, Marxian economics, and development economics over the years. And his first book, Marxian Economic Theory, in 1973 was followed by a number of others. Now married to his LSE colleague, Gail, his first wife, she was the daughter of George Ambler Wilson. They had three children. Um, and during the course of writing Nehru's Hero, Nehru's Hero, he met Kishwa Alwalia, now Kishwa Desai, his second wife, who worked as an editor for this book. So here is a man with an extraordinary vision and overview of what has been going on in economic events globally who has a great deal to say and is a deep thinker about what is happening in India now with an election coming. And we are very privileged, Lord Desai, to have you with us here in Edinburgh tonight. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Roddy. Thank you, uh, Adrian. Uh, and welcome, all of you. Uh, some of you know a lot about India, and some of you don't know much. I have 20 minutes in which to kind of rush you through a lot of stuff, so we'll leave a lot of uh, time for question and answers. Now, uh, the Indian economy has been going through a rather bad patch for the last two years. An economy which used to grow at about 8% plus and had done for the first 10 years of the 21st century uh, has now been reduced to growing only at 5%. 5% uh, is something George Osborne would give his right arm for, but that's another story you won't get into. Uh, but more than that, unlike in previous Indian uh, sort of uh, economic history, there has been persistent inflation. Uh, for now for nearly four and a half years, inflation in high single digit or low double digit uh, rates, which is very unusual because India is actually an inflation averse country and normally governments are always take quick steps to uh, stop inflation going up. Uh, the, the drop in growth rate is due to what they call a policy paralysis. About three years ago, the government, which is the Congress party-led UPA government, United Progressive Alliance, they have been in power since 2004. 
The first five years, they were very, very successful. The second five years, they had problems. Uh, elections are due in May 2014. Uh, now, uh, the government got into what's called a policy paralysis. They had a lot of corruption scandals and scams, as they call in India, and there seems to have been a reluctance to take decisions. A lot of projects are held up, especially infrastructure projects. Nothing is moving, and therefore investment is down and inflation is very high. So households have reduced their savings to keep up the living standards. The Central Bank, the Reserve Bank of India, has uh, used high interest rates as an anti-inflation strategy. And it's always made clear that they think inflation is also due to demand pressures, partly deficit spending by the government, and they want government to give a clear signal that deficit is under control. India has also had high current account deficit for the last uh, uh, two, three years, and the rupee has suffered uh, quite a uh, sizable depreciation. Uh, now, that is, by the way, a background. My, my own view is that the, the drop in growth rate is uh, a political uh, uh, result. And once uncertainty of elections are over, and there is a government in power, whichever government in power, the growth rate will be restored somewhat. It, it, it could go back to 7% without much trouble. Whether it goes to 8 or 8 and how depends on what kind of government comes to power and, and so on. I, I, I'll, I'll go to it later on. The inflation, however, is a very interesting story that it is actually a policy tool used by the government. The government which came to power in 2004, Congress government, was, uh, was actually elected by surprise because the previous government was called a, run by the other national party, the BJP was very successful 1998 to 2004. They had a very good track record. They invented this uh, phrase, India shining, and everybody was talking about India at Davos and everywhere else, and they lost the election. And the Congress Party interpreted that as saying that they, they won the election because while growth had taken place, the fruits of growth had gone entirely to the urban people and not the rural people. And so they decided that their strategy was going to be redistribute and uh, redirect resources to the rural areas. As part of that, a high food grains price strategy has been used by, uh, by increasing procurement prices for farmers, and then there's a rural employment guarantee scheme, and so on. And all, all accounts that I know of from people who are in retail business, and etc., say there is a lot more prosperity in the rural areas. So the, the, the redistribution has been successful, but there is immense resentment in the urban areas about the inflation. Really, I mean, uh, quite unusually in India, even among sort of well-off middle-class households over lunch people talk about the price of vegetables, which is, hasn't happened in, in previous years that I, I know of, especially price of onions. Uh, you know, onions have to be bought every day for Indian cooking. And, um, usually people buy vegetables every day because they want them fresh. And so they're very conscious of vegetable prices as they go up and down day to day. Onions are absolutely basic ingredient to all Indian cooking, and therefore onions are very precious. Anyway, uh, governments have fallen on onion prices. <coughs> so the question now is, here is a, here is a government which had, uh, which had a, a sort of almost 10 years of run. Uh, out of which about seven years they had, they had a good growth record and they have, they have uh, had a you know, fall off in growth recently. Inflation is high, but they want that that way. They have now passed some more welfare state type legislation, especially a rather controversial legislation about subsidized food availability to practically two thirds of the population. It's called Food Security Act and things like that. It's a gamble. The gamble is that by securing the rural vote, they hope to get elected. On the other hand, the opposition party, the principal opposition party, the BJP, the part of the Janata Party, has taken another kind of gamble, and they have they are in opposition. They have in 
uh, opposition. Uh, and they have taken a gamble by uh, pre-announcing their prime ministerial candidate, which is somewhat unusual in a Westminster-type system. Uh, uh, Narendra Modi, who is Chief Minister of Gujarat, a very controversial figure, but somebody who has won three elections in Gujarat and become Chief Minister. He's controversial because in 2002, that was a very major, major what they call a communal riot, uh, in which uh, about a thousand people died, mainly Muslims, but also some Hindus. And he has been blamed for not acting enough, if not conniving, in what had happened. There's a very controversial issue. There's been no conviction uh, that he has faced so far, but the controversy continues. But he is a very unusual person, because thus far, it's very rare for somebody who is a state chief minister who has not worked in Delhi at the center to be a candidate for prime minister. And in a sense, he has displaced the normal leadership of his party in Delhi and emerged. He's immensely popular. He's a fantastic public speaker, he's immensely popular, very controversial, and it, it looks like he will be a, he will be a big, big uh, card for BJP to pay. On the other side, the Congress Party has a, has a dynastic structure because the, the Nehru Gandhi family have been in leadership for, for about you know, 60 years. And uh, Rahul Gandhi, who's a young, uh, uh, young well, he's not that, he's 43 year old, uh, and, and his mother, Sonia Gandhi, they kind of run the party. And the idea is that Rahul Gandhi will emerge as the, as the rival leader. Rahul Gandhi is not a very good public speaker. He doesn't really have but with practical experience, and he is a sort of erratic uh, behavior. But idea is that somehow for the first time in Indian politics, there would be a presidential type contest in which both parties announce a prime ministerial candidate. Uh, and, and so we, we, are, we are all uh, waiting to see what will, what will happen. Now, in my view, what's on one hand, there is a short run dynamics of election, who wins election, and so on. That is that. But there is another dynamic going on, which is that India's demographics is changing very, very fast. Two thirds of India's population is under 35. And the politics does not reflect at any level these, uh, this generational strength of the young. And the next election, the electorate is going to be 790 million people, uh, which, is, which is not a problem because the Indian election system handles numbers like that. 120 million new voters are going to be voting because they have grown up since 2009. So clearly it is a election in which uh, either immediately now or very soon the tectonic plate should be shifting in Indian politics and we should be having a much younger leadership. Uh, Indian party structure is quite moribund. Parties are not internally democratic. Uh, most parties are either family parties. Uh, BJP is not a family party. It's much more an ideological party. But apart from the communist parties and BJP, most other parties are, are family-run parties, uh, caste-based family-run parties. Now, there is one party very recently established, which is you know anti-corruption party. It's going to run in the local and state elections in Delhi. It's the first modern type party with open recruitment, transparent structures, and so on. This could be a harbinger for the future. We don't know. Uh, how how do you change an old politics and have a new politics? Do you have a whole new sort of party system, or do the old parties transform themselves? That is going to be the big issue. And uh, in a sense, uh, there is a contingent event which I ought to mention, that there was a previous young prime minister, a man called Rajiv Gandhi, uh, whose mother was prime minister and the mother was assassinated. So he became prime minister with, a, with no experience. Uh, but he was moderately successful prime minister. He, he could not get reelected in 1989, but in 1991, his party was pretty well ahead, and he got assassinated. Uh, now, had he lived, the trans transformation to a new generation may have come earlier. He was only 48 when he, when he got assassinated. 
But that didn't happen. So 20 years later, we are kind of waiting for another transformation of Indian elections. Now, here is a very vibrant democracy. At the same time, it is democracy in which people are uh, sophisticated enough to know how to choose between parties. In India, the poor vote more assiduously than the rich. And the rural areas vote more assiduously than the urban areas. And so it's a, a, unlike, unlike in most, most other countries. And the, the voters are smart enough to be bribed by all sides and, and vote whoever they want to vote for. I mean, this is a, it's also a paradox that the turnout is higher the more local the election. Uh, you know, the, the people really turn out for, for uh, the national elections about, about 60, 65%, but higher percentages for state elections and really for local elections, even higher percentage. So people see politics in a very uh, instrumental way. They get things from the government. They get things from the state. And they use the elected uh, people as agents to secure those things. Uh, because there is no straightforward uh, anonymous uh, rights delivery. Uh, you have to kind of have to be intermediated by some agent and they'll get you what you, what you are entitled to. So politics plays a role of uh, uh, agency uh, to deliver what the state is supposed to deliver to you. And it's a, it's a, it's, you know, it's a, it's a well-known, of course it's horrendously corrupt, but uh, most Asian politics is horrendously corrupt. Uh, uh, we can talk about that later on. So, um, my, I don't know how much time I have, uh, but uh, let me, let me uh, say one more thing. Uh, I expect that uh, the BJP uh, will form the government in a coalition uh, with Narendra Modi as Prime Minister. I'll stick my neck out. Uh, but the problem in India still is, and I think I'm generally saying it for the benefit of Edmund Butler, uh, that there is no fiscally responsible political party. You know, there's no party which actually thinks that they ought to run a balanced budget. Uh, they, all of them think that the revenue in you know, some mysterious process generates growth. And that money is to be spent on various clientelist uh, schemes. And efficiency of government spending or uh, prudence in spending or kind of planning a, 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 kind of the debt structure properly is neither party, neither the two major parties actually uh, are, uh, are interested in that. Uh, India is rare, I, I think it must be the only country, in which one third of annual tax revenue is spent on interest payment or debt, which is absurd when they have got a captive banking sector which is owned by the government, they still end up paying 9.5% interest on debt, which is outrageous. But anyway, there we are. Uh, so, uh, what you have, you have, in a sense, there's a man called Guru Charan Das, who writes a very interesting book. He says, India grows at night. India grows at night when the government is not awake. And, and when the government is awake, the, India stops growing. And there, there's some truth to that. There is tremendous innovative entrepreneurial energy in the Indian private sector. And most of the growth comes thanks to the Indian private sector. And in a sense, what one wants out of a government is minimal interference. And it remains to be seen whether Narendra Modi, whose uh, slogan is uh, minimum government, maximum governance, uh, whether that, uh, whether he delivers on that. Because government, even if he gets elected, he's only one out of many and, and the system the political system is not used to minimum governance. It's used to, because the way it works is that a lot of election financing is done by what's called black money. And government spending partly serves the function of, you know, you put the money out there, you take your cut at various levels, and you put that money back into the electoral system. I mean, this is the way the corruption works. So 
okay, people benefit themselves, but by and large, you have to put the money back. And uh, this is. So there is also a very functional, uh, corruption is very functional in the democratic system. Now, whether a system can break out of that is a question. I think not. But can it at least deliver less interference in the private sector decision so that people can get along and, and make money honestly and not be interfered by the government? No. The culture, the political culture across all parties is statist. You know, they all believe that the state is absolutely the most important thing in, in the economy. Well, they really mean the government, not the state, but that, you know. Uh, and it is not done to say liberal reforms were a great and positive influence on the Indian economy. We couldn't have been growing at 8.5% had it not been for liberal reform. You can't say the private sector in India is a fantastic thing and it is the strength of the Indian economy. No way. The political system only talks in coded things if it wants to say things like that. So it's a, it is a peculiar culture in which uh, uh, you know, growth sort of happens, but. Uh, that's because the system is not very efficient in stopping growth. But uh, to the extent that it is, there is a struggle. Rather than being uh, private sector oriented, what you get is crony capitalism. So you don't have competitive private sector with good regulatory system. There, there are regulatory systems there. But by and large, uh, if, you want, if you want to get on, especially for big business, they all have to uh, be in a network with politicians, so crony capitalism. So crony capitalism rather than competitive capitalism. So all those problems are there. I think despite that, if we get a, a decent election result, uh, uh, we, we could at least have India growing at 7.5%. And if by some chance, some reforming instinct uh, Turns up in one of the uh, in a winning party, and and they get uh, they get ahead. Uh, India could actually go potentially even at double digit in my view. There is a big demographic dividend to be earned. There is a there is a lot of uh, savings in the economy, uh, and foreign capital is willing to come to India. Now, whether it'll happen or not, I don't know. Uh, uh, let me stop there, and then we can take questions. Come and sit down. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, I might just start us off, if I may, Aidan, which is that you once described um, China and its economy as a pe precious porcelain vase. And you then went on to say, India, you said, India is like a great big mud pie. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Would you like to elaborate on that? Yeah. Well, what I, what I meant by that, that in China looks super stable, but it could crack. And if it cracks, and in Chinese history, there is a record that China occasionally cracks and spends about 10 years in complete chaos and anarchy and so on, the Taiping Rebellion, the Box Rebellion, and the great proletarian cultural revolution <coughs> which Mao unleashed on uh, on the Chinese economy. Extremely costly, lots and lots of, and then it suddenly goes back to central East, highly controlled economy. So, you know, it is like a vase which is strong but brittle. India is like a mud pie. It is soft, but it can always be reshaped all the time. Anybody can shape it. Uh, and then again, it can dissolve itself. But its, it's super stability is a strength that it doesn't have this kind of brittleness. Uh, that that was that was sort of my my little analogy, which is which has now become quite a current. Of, Thank you, Eamon. Eamon, yeah. Thank you, Eamon Button, the answer to the institute. Um, crony capitalism is really it takes two sides to tango, yeah. and uh, not just capitalists, but 
you get crony capitalists because politicians basically have too much power and capitalists mm -hmm. sidle up to, to politicians. So the problem that you're describing seems to be not really an economic problem, but a problem of a public choice problem of, of yeah. democracy, um, where uh, unlimited democracy ends up in populism, and then you get get an auction for stolen goods, as, as Mencken uh, called elections. Um, do you see any constitutional way around that, or uh, are there any moves at all to, to limit government? Um, and are people mindful that uh, after the 1991 reforms, when you did have a much more liberal economy, then things started to grow, perhaps we ought to have more liberalism. Is there, is there no yeah. sign of that at all? <clears throat> but the civil society is very conscious of what ought to be done. Uh, India is also a peculiar thing. There are a lot of laws, anti-corruption. The question is implementing the laws. But the civil society has a whole sort of a menu of what should be done. I was at one of those things in which sort of distinguished people, private sector and all the way there, and they were saying what can we do. For example, people would like the election financing to be reformed, made much more transparent. Uh, it is not transparent right now. What I mean, you know, we have been through in UK uh, disasters in election finance. My own party passed a passed a law and then went on to subvert it uh, in a most classic fashion. So we and we know where that uh, happens. But reform of election law. And recently something happened again, which is quite a, uh, a news item. But there was a there is a constitutional provision. Uh, Partly because during independence movement, people went to jail for good reasons. Going to prison is not a bad thing. So the constitution said that people cannot be excluded uh, from parliament because, because they were previously criminally convicted. Then the government tried to say that if somebody has been convicted but has an appeal lodged, then that, that person cannot be. And Supreme Court ruled that that is nonsense, that, that the government has no such power. Government was going to pass an ordinance to overcome that and pass a bill later on, uh, partly to save a couple of prominent politicians who are about to go to jail. Uh, and then the, the young Rahul Gandhi had a tantrum, a very fruitful tantrum, and he leveraged his totally arbitrary power into stopping the government from passing the ordinance. The ordinance was dropped, and distinguished politicians are beginning to go to jail. Now, that kind of reform, that is the first step in which this kind of cozy coalition of all politicians. See, the problem is, you know, it's like the forbidden city in China. All politicians are together in this, government and opposition. And corruption is democratized among the politicians. So once you're in the, neighbor, uh, in the forbidden city, you're all right. And you are sort of immune from, from the legal thing. Now, this has breached that particular and the party I was mentioning, which is currently uh, running for election in Delhi, is called Aam Aadmi Party, Common, Common Man Party. It is dedicated only to be an anti-corruption party. You know, so now, we'll have to see whether an anti-corruption party is so one, one uh, agenda. But young party, very transparent. If it scores, then that might begin to change. But in India, politics uh, change will only come endogenously. Nobody can come riding on a white horse and change it. The political system will have to either a generational change or things like this, one after other law falls down. And uh, hopefully, uh, so I'm, I can't give you much hope, but uh, uh, change, change will. Uh, Sounds like Westminster. Uh. Could I suggest we might? Sorry. I could, if I could suggest we might take three questions. We'll note them sequentially, and then and then get an answer sure, sure. from Lord Decide. So no problem. First question yeah. there. Malcolm Oliver, you were talking about the um, difficulty of uh, uh, getting governments that, to do the right thing in India, oh. and. Um, prompted by some of the conversations that are going on in Scotland at the moment. I just wonder, is there an argument that perhaps India is now too big to govern as one entity? Is there any, any um, uh, debate about splitting into you know, different, uh, uh, 
on different yeah, countries. I, 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 I get the uh, question. Yeah. And would there I get the question. Economically, would there be any, um, uh, yeah. any value in that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Another question. Right at the back, at the top. Okay. Again, say who you are, please. Yeah. So, hi, I'm Manish. Uh, my question was that you said that UPA, ha UPA had a very successful first term, but uh, yeah. don't you think it was actually a result of the projects and the schemes that the NDA had launched when uh, in their 1990-2004 term, and when they resulted or they came into existence and fully functional, and UPA just uh, reaped off their benefits from uh, the okay. forms yeah. that NDA had done? Okay. We're going to take one more question. Thanks. Yeah. In this in this session. Right. right let's go with those two. Lord okay. Uh, <clears throat> on the first question, uh, as a post-colonial country, unity of the country is absolutely vital to the political system. You cannot talk about any division, any partition, ever. That's first thing. Secondly. Over the years, India started with a centralist logic because at independence there was a partition. The idea was that if you don't have a strong center, the country will fall apart. But over the years, states have got more and more powerful. So it's a much more federal polity than used to be the case. And what's happened in the last 20 years is that at the center, no single party has commanded sufficient majority to be able to govern on its own. So there have been coalition governments uh, for last, uh, well, sort of 20, 26, 24 years. And so what it means is there are two large parties, they gather about, say, 140, 150 seats, sometimes 180. Then they have to fight, find another 100, 120 uh, seats to form a majority. And so a government typically is one big party and 10 small parties. And a party with 10 seats has a lot of leverage. Uh, and so you really have a much more federal structure now. Uh, in, in, but India is absolutely committed that there will be no secession allowed, period. Uh, and if anybody starts, that can be incredible violence uh, visited by, there was a movement by the Sikh called Khalistan. They tried to, to argue for a, independent Punjab, and, and the most horrendous violence was done. But the rest of the country approves of anything like that. You just don't break up India. India is actually not ungovernable at all. Uh, I mean, it has, it has survived whatever it is now, 67 years, uh, 66 years after independence. And, you know, compared to its neighbors, a remarkably well-governed place. When you look at Pakistan, or look, look at Sri Lanka, even Sri Lanka had a civil war, Pakistan had a civil war, uh, you know, so, so you know, that's, that's, not, that's not a problem. It looks a mess. It always looks a mess. But it is, and I think it's a super stable thing, because it, it is one of the most, in terms of the way people vote, it has more legitimacy than most governments I know of. You know, two thirds of your electorate votes. Sometimes they throw the government out. So they're going to, and the and poorest people wait patiently in queue for hours to vote. It's a remarkable story. You know, and no hanging chads. You know, the, the, the very perfectly efficient electoral system. I mean, it actually, in terms of conduct of elections, it is the most advanced and sophisticated system that is anywhere in the world. I mean, not like here. You have you have to wait till four o'clock in the morning to get the results. In India, all national results are done together, and it's done within two hours. 700 million votes are counted. So, you know, this is, this is a very sophisticated system. Now, on that, on the other question, you know, yes, you know, in, in economics, you can always say, well, lags and leads. You know, did, did, this, did this particular uh, government benefit from a previous government. Well, then you say, well, did the NDA, BJP government 19, benefit from other, the previous people? You see, what really is, until very recently, there was a continual and consensual liberal reform process. No party, even the Communist Party, with a brief take into power, stopped or reversed the reform process. 
because reform is very consensual. Nobody goes out and rushes. You have to negotiate and negotiate to compromise. So since 1991 until about 2010, there has been steady reform. Now, right now, it's been stopped partly because what is called contingent reasons of these people I mean, having made a mess. But consensual reform will continue, but it will not be radical. There will no radical break. The system is not capable of radical breaks. Craig Cameron, uh, given the paralysis that you talk about and the bureaucracy, would you advise any external commercial organization to think of entering into the Indian market? Right. Okay. Next question. Take three. Yeah. Uh, Adam Forsyth, um, I was just interested in your comments on the agency nature of government and I know that there's uh, quite a sophisticated identity card system now being put into place within India. Do you think that could have a real political effect or is it just okay. cosmetic? Identity cards and then the third. And the gentleman here, yeah. Gentleman here. Yeah. Shall I just go? It's, co no. it's coming, it's coming. It's coming. Hi, Alex Scott Tong, you mentioned um, the, the, the flourishing of entrepreneurship within the economy. And I just wondered if what, what, how big a role that has in driving, driving out corruption within um, the economy. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Uh, now, on the on, on first case about external, you know, uh, a lot of foreign direct investment does come to India. Recently, the rules have been more liberalized and so on. And there are two kinds of problems. Uh, one is that governments feel obliged for popular reasons to allow FDI and then put spokes in the wheel just to see that they are, they are not going to be cowed by this, you know. Uh, IKEA uh, came for, as under the FDI in single retail branches. And they're negotiating, and so suddenly uh, the minister in charge said, "Ah, but you want to have a coffee shop in the shop in the in the store? That is multiple retail. That's not single retail." It was stupid thing one could have said. Why did he say it? Well, he's trying to maybe he's trying to get a bit more bribe. I, you know, it's I, you know, because IKEA may suffer if uh, they are found to be bribing. I don't want to say anything about that. Now, I think by and large in India, the key is patience. Things will happen. It's a big market, things will happen. But you have to, and secondly, always put a lot of time in knowing where you're going to go. Your local India Studies Department will tell you. You know, a lot of expertise available in UK on India, and they're all in academic departments. And academics are cheap, I tell you, much cheaper than consultants. Uh, and they actually know. I mean, your anthropologists will know which state you're going to and what is the politics and what kind of problems you're, you're going to go. So if you invest properly, then India is doable. A lot of people have done India. And so it should not be, should not be put off by, by stories about corruption and so on. It, it can, you know, pe people have been able to do business. Now, the ID card and, and uh, is... Uh, is, and also connect to the ne next question. Uh, the government has uh, had an amazingly entrepreneurial scheme of giving people personal identity cards with a with a eye uh, recognition and some other stuff, and they're going to issue I don't know, eight hundred million identity cards. Uh, they already issued, uh, I think, about two to three hundred million. And the idea is that that would be your passport to entitlements. See, I was saying before that the state could not deliver a thing people are entitled to without an intermediate agency. If this identity card thing goes through, it will fundamentally transfer politics. Because then people will not need to go through their MLA or their municipal councillor to get what they want. They could go and say, here it is, here is my card, here is my identity card. Now, Supreme Court just said that identity card cannot be required uh, to receive uh, entitlements, you know. I, 
They may be convenient, but they cannot be uh, legally required. But that's a, that's a small thing. It's an most amazing uh, technological triumph. And given that the British government gave it gave up any idea of having that in regards, you know, for a for a project, you know, one tenth of the size of uh, what India is trying to do, it's quite. But there is a logic now emerging, even among people who like this uh, entitlement thing, that they should go to direct cash transfer. Rather than giving people goods, they ought to give people direct cash. Uh, as part of the welfare state. Now, there's, there's a lot of struggle going on. We could call a lot of people who are, you know, the progressive left hate this because they, they kind of, uh, again, it takes away a lot of, uh, a lot of clout from, from the active politics. But that is one of the things which is probably likely to come, say, if the BJP gets into power, they'll be perfectly happy with that. They're a much more techno-savvy party. Uh, and they could easily use that. And if that happens, and in a sense that which connects with what you're saying about entrepreneurship, that a lot of people, even in the government, are using online uh, technology to cut out the middleman. You know, for example, one of the things that Transparency International concluded about four years ago, that the people who are called below poverty line people, however, had just spent 800 million rupees within one year in bribes to get more or less what they're entitled to. And these things, there are things like, you know, admission to schools, land certificates, uh, uh, being able to file a complaint to the police. Now, all those things can be overcome by making it online. And so online technology, a lot of people are, are, are developing very interesting uh, interesting ways in which they could overcome. And so, you know, I think there is technical expertise and maybe a generation change will make it possible. But, you know, it will take time. Take maybe five years. Can we talk a little bit about the, uh, the environment? Um, it's, it's known that one of the great problems that, that, that India has, for example, is with water. And there's this talk of China diverting water from the Himalayas. Mm. Uh, we also know that the water table is falling. Yeah. Um, do you have a view on this? And, and maybe there are some people also in the audience who would like to talk about I can see some people over there particularly who might like to say something about that. Um, Dr. Dryden. And on that subject, if anybody else has got any issues, let's say with the environment, uh, in connection with India and China and its neighbours. Again, a gentleman at the back. Right, let's go with those two to start off with. Yeah, uh, my name's Howard Dryden, the company is Dryden Aqua. Uh, we're presently working in uh, West Bengal uh, with uh, Jandapur University, with Professor Aziz Mazundar. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the, the issues we're working on is the presence of arsenic in the water. Oh, yes. No, um, there is a long, long-standing problem of arsenic in water. Yeah, uh, ma major issues, and uh, somewhere in the region of quarter per billion people in India have uh, water above the world health limit for arsenic. And um, not only you know the drinking water is an issue, but um, uh, river water pollution. You know, 75 yeah. to 80 percent of the rivers are yeah. grossly contaminated, uh, and the same applies to the groundwater. Now, this must have an impact not only on public and you know, public health, but uh, impacting on the economy and the, you know, the water resources are, are central to all economies. Mm. Um, so, you know, do you have anything to say on uh, the impact of water quality and uh, environmental conditions on the economy of India? Another question. Gentleman okay. back. Uh, so, my question is that uh, UPA particularly says that it's trying to bring in big investment investors from abroad, uh, like steel investors like POSCO, uh, the Mithils from the UK, based out of the UK, etc. But then uh, when they talk about environmental clearances for these uh, big steel projects, uh, there seems to be a conflict of interest. I mean, uh, one side of the UPA says that uh, we want big investments, but then on the other side, these companies are not granted environmental clearances because, uh, because I mean, you're cutting down a lot of part of forests and you're diverting a lot of water for yeah. industries. Yeah. Thank you. Anybody else want to add to that? No, I think, uh, <coughs> no, um, 
There are several water problems. Uh, the arsenic in West Bengal water is something I've been hearing about for 35 years. And people, people were telling me they were going to go do something. And, and I had a friend called Vinay Chand, whose father was in the diplomatic service. And he was going back and forth when the communists were in power. And he was saying, I'm doing something about arsenic in water. I mean, it's, it must be a horrendous problem, and nobody's doing enough about it. You know, by and large, West Bengal governments have not been efficient for the last 50 years. Uh, let's put it that way. Now, the pollution in river waters is a very serious problem. All the major rivers are very badly polluted because chemical effluents and are, are just allowed to go in there. Again, the laws are there, but they're not implemented. And uh, you know, there is whole movements to have a, the Ganga River more clean and so on. And there are people going on fast and so on. But serious action is not happening, partly because the government is not willing, it's able, but it's not willing to take on the people who are breaking the law. And the civil society is very conscious, you can get very good technical people who will point out what the problems are, what should be done, very good websites on, but uh, action is there. Now, on the other hand, on, on the question of giving uh, permissions, most recently, uh, in, in UPA2, there have been a number of investments stopped because they wanted environmental clearance and, uh, and actually you know, some people were accused of the ex environment minister, man called Jairam Ramesh, of practically costing 3 percentage point rate of growth of the Indian economy by stopping large things. So, I mean, on the one, you know, and it's, it's an open question as to whether those, uh, those environmental clearances are being denied was over the top or not over the top. It is going to, uh, see, one part of the Congress is hostile to all investment, especially mineral investment, especially Rahul Gandhi, because the question of tribal rights involved. You know, some of the things where the, where the mines are, there are, there are tribes, and they had uh, collective property, common property rights. Now, the common property rights were taken away because something was nationalized. And then there's private ties. There's a big struggle about that. So in some parts, like in Orissa, there's a big controversy about POSCO. POSCO hasn't got the permission to do uh, the steel works now for 15 years. They've been around. And uh, Vedanta, which is another big firm, had a problem with its mining operations. So, I mean, there is... Uh, there is uneven action on some things and not enough action on other things. And so there is no clear, uh, straightforward, environmental, uh, implementable policy, but there are a number of ad hoc interventions. Now, uh, Jairam Ramesh is a very articulate uh, person and whom I know very well. He's very proud that he put environment on the agenda and not just allow it growth, growth, growth. But at some stage, you'll have to kind of decide as to which way to strike the balance. And uh, a change of government will change the balance. <laughs> but I don't think India has got a, uh, a serious environmental policy. Uh, water, for example, the water table has fallen very, very sharply because uh, water, uh, water is a subsidized uh, Commodity, the government pays people to dig deeper, deeper uh, wells. Uh, in Punjab, there's been a, uh, a water table uh, fall, a disaster. You know, I've, I've just been reading about China, uh, uh, about how China has a very similar problem, a hugely polluted rivers, water shortage, water imbalance between north and south, so on. Now, I can't, I can't make up my mind genuinely whether this is the sort of thing which goes on and, you know, civilization still go on producing and so on, and it's not the optimal way, but it'll go on. Or will there be really a growth catastrophe? I don't know. I genuinely don't know. 
because China has been growing at some horrendous rate and environmentally completely irresponsible for the last 40 years uh, and hasn't done it any harm or hasn't come to a halt. So it's an open question. I think what, what India has a very articulate policy is when it comes to participation in a Kyoto Protocol, wherever it involves external relations, they know what they will or they will not do vis-a-vis -vis the international agencies. But for internal reform, there is, no, there is no clout in any political party which will look at environment. You know, maybe, maybe the next generation will pay for it, but you know. Yes. Sorry? Yeah. You want to carry on? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I um, don't entirely agree with you. Well, Sorry? I don't he doesn't entirely, entirely agree with you. <laughs> no, of course not. Why should you? <laughs> I don't expect anyone to agree with what I say. Good company, then. Um, I'll give you one example that uh, we're working on, not in, not in India, but in Bangladesh, uh, regarding sustainable environmental issues. Now, uh, in Bangladesh, or Dhaka is a city of some 22 million people. Mm -hmm. uh, the economy of Bangladesh is based on the textile industry, of which there are 283 companies. And they are grossly polluting their environment. Uh, the water or the rivers are in Bangladesh, 100% grossly contaminated. The uh, groundwater is also dropping. 75% of the groundwater is also contaminated. And uh, that city runs out of water in five years. So. Irrespective of government issues, I think um, uh, you know, environmental issues will have a life of their own. They have to solve their environmental issues or the country runs out of water. You know, I, I always think that optimists think there will be an environmental disaster. Pessimists think the bloody thing will go on forever. I'm a pessimist. You clearly shouldn't talk about your glass being half full or half empty. No, no, no. I mean, I mean, in a sense, uh, I, I grew up in, in days when we were constantly expecting a nuclear disaster. And there used to be programs saying the clock is at five minutes to 12, and any time you're going to get destroyed. And having lived through that, uh, I, I, I'm appreciative of disaster stories, but I'm not, you know, I don't think it'll happen. People will find something somewhere. Sadly. We'll find a solution, hopefully. Yeah. By using which, which, which will not be an ideal solution. By using a Scottish company, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Gentleman with an orange sweater here. Hi, Brett Manning. Um, there's a very clear pattern of China going around buying up global assets, especially resources and the ability to procure those resources. It's less obvious that India has been as outward looking, certainly in the last 10 years, um, but perhaps more recently, there have been some steel acquisitions for sure. Um, do you think India is looking at its own problems in, internally too much and maybe needs to face out to the world a little bit more? Well, I'm sure India go on a shopping spree like China. Why? You know, I, I think, I think you know, it's a, one thing about the Chinese growth uh, uh, strategies. It's immensely wasteful of capital. It's the most capital destructive strategy I've seen. Because they've got financial repression, they can get 50% household savings, and then they proceed to waste it like nothing on earth. I mean, in, uh, at last year I heard a number that uh, some in, 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 uh, in China at that time, 78 million houses have been built but were unoccupied. Uh, right? I mean, any country that does that needs this head examined. Uh, so, you know, you know and, and going around the world, Africa, you know, it didn't work for the West, it won't work for them. Uh, you know, but I, I really do think that, uh, you know, again, for example, India is very dependent on energy imports. I mean, they ought to think intelligently about energy saving and, and, and exploiting some uh, lo local, local resources. I mean, uh, just because there happens to be a thing out there, there's no need to rush out and buy it. Uh, you know, I think. In, in, at, at least in India, the infrastructure strategy is that supply lags behind demand. You know, supply, and I think that's a much better capital saving strategy than the supply to be ahead of demand. 
So my, I'm, I'm not all that confident of the Chinese uh, development strategy. Question there, lady. Blue dress, I think, yes. Can identify who you are, if you would, please. Thanks. Thanks. Hi, my name is Sandrine, and my question concerns the status of women in, in India. How has the, the position of women in India evolved over the years, and what does the future look like for women in India, and how would that affect the economy as well? Women in India. Do we yeah, have yeah, yeah, yeah. questions on the same subject? Many of the ladies here? I don't really. Right, sorry. No, 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 women in India, it's a very, very serious issue, partly because of what happened recently in the Delhi gang rape case, and there is this immense anxiety about safety of women in India. Uh, what, is, what is now happening is more of those issues are being articulated. For example, more uh, more assaults on women, rapes are being reported and being at least registered by the police as complaints and so on. The system is very, very bad for women. There's no doubt about that. There is female feticide, uh, which is very, very uh, widespread. And female feticide happens not in poor, but in prosperous regions, preference for boys rather than girls. And with the new technology, uh, you know, amniocentesis, People go and find out there's going to be a girl, and the girl, the girl is, uh, uh, you know, is aborted. Uh, and of course, uh, there is very strong patriarchy, and therefore there is a problem of uh, of uh, women's position not being very good. At the same time, what you do have is a increasingly articulate civil society movement to, as it were pose the problems of women's rights, women's safety, women's position, and do something legislatively about it. Again, uh, there is a contrast between urban and rural. Uh, lots more women going to work, uh, and that also causes conflict in a patriarchal society. But, you know, it is, it is, it is not good. Uh, but it is being more openly discussed and dealt with. Uh, I mean, the fact that this uh, the Delhi gang rape case led to passage of a new new act uh, about quick uh, uh, quick judicial system and punishment, and the fact that that case itself only took seven months uh, to decide was thought to be you know maybe maybe eight months so was thought to be quite an advance because otherwise cases go on forever. It's you know. In, in newspapers and TV and so on, the media are reporting every day. It looks like, my God, what's happened? It's just the reporting has become better, more open. These things are coming out open. And women are willing to go and file a complaint and no longer feel that it will be, be humiliating to them. And the parents are willing to, to fight for them. So consciousness is rising. Whether there will be actual object improvement, we shall see. But uh, there, there, there is no doubt that there is a... That, that's a big, big, big movement going on. I'm going to ask you the last question, if I may. Um, uh, let, let me just advertise my wife's novel. Yes. Uh, <laughs> my, 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 my wife wrote a novel called Witness the Night, uh, which is about female feticide, uh, which got the Costa Best First Novel Award two years ago. Uh, it's about female feticide in the Punjab. Just got a prize in France. Uh, translation, but you know there are issues that are being written up in novels and in essays and films and so on. So there's a greater consciousness. Okay. Wonderful. Do you have any copies with you? No, no, no. Good. I wanted to ask a last yeah. question, which is that our sort of reason for existing is that a number of us believe that the time has come for Scotland to re-engage with this part of the world, yeah. uh, with Asia and with India in particular. Yeah. And I asked you in our interview before the the, the larger session what you thought about this and what your view was and what the opportunity was for people living in Scotland to do to engage again with this part of the world. Could you comment on that? Yeah, no, I mean, there's, there's uh, not only a great history of Scotland in India, and most of it is in terms of skilled uh, jobs, you know, engineers and, 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 you know, scientists and bankers and uh, 
educationists and so on. But also, I'm sure that there are things that India needs uh, which can be supplied. I mean, for example, uh, quite a lot of uh, Indians who had gone abroad are returning because, uh, uh, you know, if you are a, if you are a MBA or so on, your lifestyle is much better in India than it will be in New York. And the same will be true of any, any Scottish MBA. I mean, just go and, and enjoy yourself and work because it's possible to do that. Uh, and it's an extremely rewarding uh, country to work in. Uh, it's, it's, you know, like anywhere else, there are frustrations, there are problems, but, you know, that's life. But, you know, I, I do hope that there'll be more, uh, more uh, visible uh, growth of relationship between Scotland and India because uh, you have to take your own brand and not be submerged under a general UK brand. Thank you very much. Well, ladies and gentlemen, please stand. Thank you. Well, we've been filming this, and you can watch it on YouTube afterwards. You can pull out of this what you will, wherever your position is. But uh, I think we've heard some very, very interesting things about uh, India and its economy from, as I said before, a leading expert. It doesn't appear to be the final collapse of a plan, depending upon what happens in the general election, right? And maybe it is a pause for breath. But we don't need to pause at all in thanking Lord Desai for coming. There's an opportunity for those of you that didn't get a chance to ask him a question, to talk to him outside uh, over a drink, kindly surprised by the business school. For those of you that have already asked him a question, even if it was two questions, you have a chance to ask even more. And so would you please uh, join me in thanking him? And in, do in so doing, before we do so, please remember the Asia Scotland Institute will continue to grow with your help, your support, and so if you don't know what to do, go and see one of the team here. Where's Wendy? And Morag? Uh, and tell them you'd like to become a member. So thank you again, Lord Desai, very much indeed for an extremely entertaining and interesting evening. Thank you. <laughs>